Good evening, everyone. Eric O'Brien here. July 20th, 2020. Curse Rage, part one of the Dwarad Heem Staff Saga. By me, Episode 6. Kerr, son of Moldrin. Eight years of soldiering and his life before the army seemed like a distant memory. His earliest years were spent at home in Lord Min's kingdom under the volcano. Those years had been filled with the learning that all young dwarves had to endure, including the ways of survival in the deepen wilds, the nature of the earth's stone, and more. But he had been different in many respects to the other dwarves his age. Indeed, he had felt a strange restlessness calling out to him to seek out untold adventures beyond the realm of the dwarves. It was a strange trait for a young dwarf to possess, for what could the outside world possibly offer to one of his kind? Luckily for Kerr, his father Moldrin had felt a similar calling in his own youth. He'd understood when the time had come for Kerr to leave. Somehow, eight years of service in a mostly human army had come to pass, and once again, the time had come for him to go. Again, his restless spirit called upon him to seek out adventures untold. Only this time, he would seek them out with others. Surprisingly, those others were not other dwarves, but rather they were members of all the goodly races on Tempest. Two were half-elven, one was a gnome, and the last was a human woman. They'd all been members of his unit, and they'd all become the closest of friends. <clears throat> they had all left the high crest, high crest garrison before him, and he longed to rejoin them and return home. <clears throat> His thoughts took him in turn to each of them as he packed. Home is such a strange word, he thought, but one which he attributed to fine friends and pleasant conversation. <clears throat> the Royal Army had been his home for a long time, but he knew that without his most trusted companions it no longer was, and so he packed without conscious effort, stowing his gear in the methodical way of a professional soldier. There were no loose straps flapping in the wind, nor any unfastened buttons that might allow some treasured item to slip out of his pack on the journey home. He did it automatically, his inner mind thinking of all the battles that he had fought, the soldiers that he had saved. He couldn't help shedding a secret tear for the ones that he could not. It was on a cold autumn morning, seven days before the full moon of Sanguis, that he began his journey. It didn't occur to him that surviving two tours of duty in the Knoll Hills was a great victory. In fact, when he reported to his brigade commander for the last time, it hadn't occurred to him at all. Knocking on Commander Orionson's office door, he received the usual, usual response. What is it, soldier? I'm busy. Corporal Cakeporter reporting for discharge, sir, he said proudly. Enter and report. Sir, Corporal Cakeporter. Stand at ease, Orionson ordered. Your things are all in order, I trust, Corporal. Yes, sir. I'm packed and ready to move out, sir. Very well, Corporal. Are you sure that I can't convince you to stay on for another tour? The reenlistment bonus stands as it always has, and I'd personally recommend you for the Officers Academy. Very sure, sir, Kerr replied with just a hint of sarcasm. Very well, Corporal. It has been an honor to serve with you. Your 176 confirmed kills have been documented, and the paperwork has been sent to Army Headquarters in Khan. Your discharge pony and personal effects are all in order, I trust. Yes, sir. Corporal Cape Porter, attention, dismissed. Commander Orionson's last command to him was loud enough for the entire garrison to have heard it. That's the way that it always was, when someone actually survived long enough to make it through a full tour of duty. Snapping his final salute, he spun in his best about face. Just a minute, soldier. Yes, sir. You're forgetting something. Sir, your medal of courage. The king himself said that I was to said that I was to order you to accept it. Everyone here believes that you should have it, and so do I. Placing the silver corded amulet around his neck, 
The commander then shook hands with his corporal and said, Good job. Kerr was too overwhelmed to speak. You're dismissed, corporal. Unlike most of the officers, officers that he had known, Commander Orionson cared for his men. He had routinely placed the needs and well-being of his soldiers before his own. It was a personal flaw that had resulted in his assignment to one of the most dangerous and remote outposts in Safe Haven. Kerr spent his last few hours at Highcrest Garrison saying farewell to all his friends at arms. Those final hours of preparation were filled with reluctant excitement. He would miss the army life, but now his life was again his own. That uh, scene <clears throat> is derived from when I uh, left the army in 1994 at Fort Benning. Uh, my company commander of Delta 269 Armor uh, promised me many things if I re-enlisted, but uh, I resisted. That scene is uh, very close to what was uh, discussed between us at that time. Okay. Cinching his pony's harness down tight with a short kick to the animal's stomach, he securely attached his bedroll, saddlebags, and other survival gear. Double-checking his work, rations, and personal equipment, he said farewell to the outpost and left through the front gate. His youthful excitement at the prospect of a new adventure fueled his spirits and put a sharp snap into his short dwarven strides. He walked with pride, for he was the son of Muldron K. Porter, hero of the past Red Orkin Wars, and the warrior spirit was a part of his history. It was a spirit that flowed strongly in the blood of his people and burned as hot as forged fire in his veins. <clears throat> Behind him, he could feel the eyes of the garrison watching him as he left, and then suddenly they erupted, there erupted a great tumult from the ramparts. All hail the mighty keg, hero of the stair, hero of the stair. He could not look back. He couldn't let them see him cry. Little did he know that each of them, to a man, was crying for him. He could have ridden his pony on that long march home, but instead he chose to walk. He had many things to think about. In his short life, he'd been born the son of a great warrior and then trained in the secret art of mushroom farming under the volcano. When he'd grown older, his father had trained him in the use of weapons. His favorites had always been the dwarven battle axe and the short sword, and he'd learned to use them like few other dwarves could. The warrior spirit was a part of his lineage. His people, the mountain dwarves, believed that they were born under the watchful eyes of the gods, Moradeus and Clangetius. They were born to be forgers and fighters. Kerr had endured a long apprenticeship to an aged mushroom farmer, and he was an expert in their cultivation. He was also privy to the secret art of brewing mushroom wine. He'd resented his apprenticeship at first, but over time, he had come to respect the old one who'd taught him. In the end, he'd learned to see the wonders of life in the deep and wilds. Indeed, this was his greatest pride, for he knew the traits of nearly every kind of mushroom and fungus that grew both above and below ground. However, mushrooms weren't the only subjects that he was knowledgeable in. The arts of war were familiar to him, and his time in the army had only helped to heighten skills that he'd already begun to develop under his father's training. He always remained prepared to enter into a fight at any moment that he conserved his strength between times of war. His journey home could become perilous, and for that he prepared well. His footman's crossbow hung across his heavy leather backpack, and a suit of sturdy mail hung from his shoulders to his knees. Around his waist was sheathed his short sword and axe, as well as a razor-sharp dagger. His boots and clothing were well-maintained, and his oil-treated canvas cloak would shield him from the rain. Upon his pony were two full water skins and a week's travel rations for himself and his steed. Thus prepared, he set out through the Knoll Hills, singing a solemn tune to while away the tedious hours of the long journey, and this is how it went. Toiling beneath rock of granite, rock of iron, my hammer-hewn pathways deep as world's own fires, I hear the voice of the master of battle, clang, clang, clangetius, ringing in the stone, ringing in my hands, to search for mithril gold, as Baldric once foretold, 
so forged the dwarves of old in mountains deep in stone. Just so, Kerr traveled on, singing his song of the dwarves' ancient magic, a supernatural force lacing all their work, and although he was no wizard, the magic of the earth sang within his heart. It was a song heard by few of the peoples of Tempest, but it was as much a part of the dwarves as their very spirit. Kerr's soul was no less earthbound than any of his own people. It was his restless heart that was different, and that was what drove him to seek out his own destiny. On and on he walked towards Waysboro, and those that told the story later would recall that his own endurance outlasted that of his strong mountain pony. It had been a long time since he had last seen his friends. One Eye Jacks Friday night, <clears throat> the 11th day of Glacies, 2147. So Carmen was your platoon sergeant in the army, Eric asked. Yes, and Kerr was my squad leader. What made you all decide to meet up again after you got out? That's a long story, but suffice it to say that we become fast friends, and we trusted each other more than anyone else in all of the world. We couldn't think of anyone else that we'd rather work with, and we didn't want the relationships that we built or our adventures to end. What were you going to do when you got back together? It's a funny thing, really. I don't think that any of us knew. It was almost like destiny itself was pulling us back together, and beyond that, we didn't have a care. But what about Dartin and Leander, Polly asked. Where did they end up, and how did they make it back to Waysboro? Well, Polly, things were a little harder on my half-elven friends. They'd hired on with an able merchant vessel named Kuromanchura, or Courageous Heart, only to be shipwrecked in a terrible storm at sea. I'll tell you all that they t I'll tell you all that they told me about it. And my story formed within their minds as my smoke drifted upon a draft of destiny all of its own. <clears throat> Koro Manchura Courageous Heart left the sheltering waters of Khan Harbor bound for Shamroon, a newly discovered continent far to the east across the endless sea. The ship was heavily laden with precious trade goods, forcing the vessel to rest deeply in the water. The ship's master, a massive human from Fulracus, barked commands with the utmost authority to crew and passengers alike. Blue-eyed and red-bearded, Captain Kane Tanakoro was descended from a long line of seafaring men, possessing the weathered face and gnarled hands of those adventuresome men who spend their lives at sea. Two of his youngest crewmen were almost inseparable, two Hellfire sailors who'd almost begged him for the job. They said that they were veterans of the Jackal Wars, but beyond that, they would speak little about their army adventures. But none of that mattered to Tanakoro, for he prized the Hellfire as sailors. Their nimble bodies were generally more dexterous than the humans, and yet they were stronger than the elves, a perfect combination for the high seas, or so he thought. In fact, Dartin and Leander had come to love their adventurous times at sea. Their captain was severe, but he was just and fair. And after they had traveled many leagues away from home, it seemed that they were at times far enough away to forget their past worries. Dartin, Leander, Fulgrim, Aramar, King commanded, trim the mainsail. Targon, adjust our course east by southeast for Shamroon. Aye, aye, sir, they answered. Leaping to the task at hand, the crew prepared for the long voyage. Back muscles straining to work the ropes, each man knew his place and his job. The voyage promised to be an easy one, and the load that they carried would bring each sailor a healthy share of the ship's profits. As they headed toward the horizon, the early summer skies promised a trouble-free journey. Once they were fully underway, the crew relaxed the tales of high seas adventure and the beautiful women of Shamroon. Leander was the best storyteller among the crew. Nicknamed Ash for his sandy hair and fine features, his mind was full of stories of old, and even more that he'd imagined on his own. Sitting with his back to the mainmast and a large red apple in each hand, he began yet another tale to while away the quiet times of their journey. At strategic intervals, he would take a large bite from one apple, 
or another to emphasize the truth of his words. It was an effective technique that was often accompanied by nods of agreement from his captive audience. Did I ever tell the tale of the sea hag, he began, being to all who sailed the endless sea. Waiting to see the reactions of the sailors who sat about him, he was reassured by their ignorance in the matter, and this helped to form his version of the story. Aye, foul in body and heart is she, sitting upon her anemone throne, commanding the creatures of the sea to bring those unfortunate sailors who lose their way. Only one sailor ever escaped from her vile clutches. His name was Sir Richard, a young knight who came from the western coast of Arundel. After being shipwrecked in a terrible storm, the horrible hag captured and tormented him for four long years in her decrepit castle in the deep. When she saw what a handsome and young man Sir Richard was, she suspended him in an iron cage above a deep undersea lagoon filled with every manner of ocean horror. Sharks and giant squid lurked there, as well as terrible sea serpents with wicked spines and envenomed fangs. For four long years he was tormented thus, being fed only enough to survive, and indeed he was beginning to look nearly as wretched as the hag herself. But during his fourth year he devised a cunning plan. Each day he would bestow all manner of compliments upon her, seeing that she was both glorious and terrible in her awesome beauty. At first she only laughed, but in time she began to think of his praise as heartfelt truth, and Sir Richard began to see his chances growing for escape. My mistress, he said one day, in all of the sea you are truly the most powerful, the most wondrous, and the most incredible in beauty. Let me bring word of your might to the lowly surface dwellers, which you despise so that all shall dread of your coming and dream of your terrible beauty. Very well, she said, but you will go with this, but you will go with a curse to hold you to your word. For know that from here ever after, whenever you shall sleep, you shall dream of me as your eternal concubine. In addition, you shall lie with me each night in my clamshell bed until the end of time. For in truth... The sea hag was lonely above all things, and it was her hopeless quest for love that had driven her poor wretchedness to evil. So be it, he said, and on the pack, the, and upon the backs of tawny sea lions, he was borne to the ocean's surface. Sir Richard was then carried to the gunwales of a mighty warship from Arundel's fleet, and the ship's crew rescued him. In fact, I was only a small boy when a very old Sir Richard told me of his tale. And it was indeed as the hag had promised him, for every night he was forced to lie with the terrible sea hag in his dreams, paying for his freedom with nights filled with eternal horror. In this manner, Leander spun his gripping tail to those unfortunate sailors who fell into the grasp of the sea hag, the superstitious minds of his fellows lending more power to his tail. His deep blue eyes seemed to glisten with the light reflecting from the ocean's surface, and his golden tan spoke of long voyages at sea. He wore the loose trousers and shirt of a sailor from the southern seas, and his light beard revealed his father's human heritage. His hands bore the heavy calluses of hard labor, and he was lean and strong. Many men misjudged his fair features as signs of youthful naivete, yet he was middle-aged by the telling of men and many adventures had wisened him beyond his years. But above all, he loved nature and all its creatures, and he remembered many fine stories of wild adventures and mishap. He spun gripping tales with the skill of a natural storyteller, and that is how most people remember him. Not even Targon, the ship's navigator, suspected the terrible typhoon that struck them that night. Coming from the east, the storm rolled in so quickly that the mainsail couldn't be brought down in time. Violent winds snapped the mast off the low decks, and its great weight ripped a tremendous wound in the deck and starboard gunwale of the mighty ship. It was then that a devastating wave slammed into that wicked tear and engulfed those below decks. Captain Tanakuro scrambled to the helm and tried to gain some control over his floundering ship. Typhoon winds buffeted him with driving rain and cascading waves but by some bit of fortune he was able to reach it. His helmsman was gone, probably swept overboard. 
If only he could gain some control. But the broken mass lay half within the surging seas, and soon it would drag them all down with it. The main deck was a broken clutter of torn rigging and rent sails, and the stormy seas tossed the ship about like a dying fish. Her decks were nearly impassable. The gigantic waves swept over her sorrowful hull in a deadly embrace. Very soon she'd not be able to provide her veteran crew with any safety at all. Water poured into the breach in her hull, and her broken limb would not allow her to right herself and thus stay afloat. If Kuramanchura could have spoken, she would have cried. The crew tried to reach the relative safety of the main deck and help those being trapped below, but a tremendous wave crested over the ship, and many sailors were swept overboard and into the maelstrom. When the wave had finally passed over them, those lost had been taken beyond rescue. Water was filling much of the hold in below deck's living quarters, and the storm threatened to swamp the ship completely if the broken mast wasn't cut free. Cut the rigging loose, Kane raged. Cut it loose! Struggling to maintain control of the helm, he was barely heard above the roar of wind and rain. And that's where we'll begin episode 7, when next we meet. Thank you. Have a good night. Remember, read Kerr's Rage. Thank you.